In the year 1492, Christopher Columbus and three ships discovered the new world, America. Well, he thought it was India, and even today, the natives are called Indians. into some of these cases, we, 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 we have things that, um, well these are all from Labrador too, um, but every now and then there's something that um, uh, will be, you know, like from Hudson's Bay Territory, uh, which, which, which could be a lost uh, Inuvialuit piece, you know, like, like to me this is interesting because um, it's got baleen, baleen yeah. um, webbing, so, you know, were people doing that around Hudson's Bay or is that a Western Arctic? Kind of all. These two would be the same. Could be. That looks very dad and nice. Inuvialuit Bay Territory. Yeah. Inuvialuit Bay Territory. Inuvialuit Bay Territory. Inuvialuit Bay Territory. Inuvialuit are a very proud people and like many of the groups in North America, many of the Aboriginal groups, they're um, increasingly um, connected to their past as a source of pride in the present. And so there's a lot of educational work going on around that. And so this is a form of kind of community development and education. You know, we've been a lot of talk about this project for so long. But one of the things that we're excited about is nobody's ever really taken a careful look at some of these uh, uh, objects. And certainly not with the knowledge uh, from Inuvialuit people from the region that sort of know more about these things. So this is a wonderful opportunity for us to learn about the pieces and to begin to build a dialogue that might lead to um, exhibitions or books or programs or really whatever it is that you'd like to do with these, with these things. I met Kathy and Mervyn many years ago and started to, or became more familiar with this collection and also through meeting Stephen Loring. And then all of a sudden we thought, well, really we should bring the objects to the elders or the elders to the objects. And seeing as it was kind of prohibitive to bring the collection north, we went the other direction. And you can see um, about the size of a football playing field. Um, and in each of the boxes are just all the collections from uh, all over the world. We've got some photographs here from um, the way things used to be up in the attic, where everything was just kind of piled um, together, and now everything has been nicely sorted and put into conservation good space. The collection is stored both geographically and then by shape. So most of the McFarland collection, most of the Inuvialuit material is up on the second floor, which is where we'll go. But some of the big pieces of clothing are right here. So let's just look at those and then we'll go upstairs. The lower garments here are, um, are uh, caribou skin robes with some of the early, uh, early beads and skin work. But I think, I think what we'll do when we want to look at these more closely is just put them out and bring them out and put them on a table. To me it's um it's really amazing for me to, you know, to see and actually hold objects and t tools and weapons for hunting that was used, you know, 150 years ago. Or it's it's really amazing. This trip for for myself and the rest of the group, I think, is. It's been a really good experience to be able to see 
um, clothing, the artifacts, the different tools and weapons that were used by our people years ago, and the preservation of them with uh, the McFarland collection that was brought down here. Um, like some of these weapons that they used, I've never ever seen them before. And it's quite interesting to, to actually be holding one in my hand, wondering how many birds or animals that person harvested with, with, a, with a weapon like this. Me personally, it's just like, well, I see these in the books. And then Kathy told me as well, it's, you know, can't, it's a chance, but I didn't want to pass up to see them, the, the garment itself that's been actually made over a hundred years ago. And I actually, like I mentioned, you know, I saw some, some of our, the old tools and objects such as ulut and uh, harpoons, spears, bow and arrows, still being used but not as much, you know, because they, they, it was passed down from, from way back, eh? So it's amazing for me, it's uh, to see and hold objects from, you know, from my ancestors. We talked a little bit about wearing gloves, and it's, 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 uh, sometimes I tell people, it's your cultural heritage. It's do what you want to do. We're just taking care of this material for you. Um, but I encourage people to wear gloves because some of these skins, especially, because they've been in the museum now for like 160 years. And in the 1880s, in order to keep the bugs from um, eating the fur, uh, they dusted it with, um, with mercury and arsenic. Now, there's not a lot, because they've gone in and vacuumed everything off, um, but it, it's still probably better, and, and, and so I encourage people to wear mittens. And then it's also like with iron objects or with glass objects, um, if you have gloves on, it, uh, it doesn't, your sweat doesn't get on the object, and, and it's just a way of, of um, helping to preserve it. When they trade with the university, um, there was a, any documentation like a receipt to, to the individual in the veil I doubt it. Those are not, they're not around, eh? I, <clears throat> well, certainly any receipt that the Nuvialuit received, there wouldn't, that, you know, yes. people wouldn't have kept paper like that in those days. Um, Often, sometimes in the log books, there's a reference to how much he paid for it or, or what was traded for. Um, and sometimes, when you're lucky enough, you get actual names of people, you know, who, who brought this, who it was acquired from. For me, what's so exciting about this project is for many, many years, um, these collections that we have, these, these anthropology collections, these ethnographic collections, were sort of the purview of a few scientists and you know, researchers, archaeologists, you know, anthropologists, they would come, they would look at a few things, they might take pictures of them, they might write an article about them. Um, but since about uh, 1995, there's been a real revolution in museum studies. There was a and big story uh, about it, and Emmanuel said, just, just leave it, because anywhere in the coast of Europe, they can find artifacts. So there's no use fighting over You know, when we were kids, <laughs> you know, when the water gets really mm -hmm. low sometimes, we used to find some art, bone, things that things come to the museum is such an interesting story, you know, there's, um, there's Japanese armor in the next case over, which was a gift from the Emperor of Japan to Teddy Roosevelt. Um, so it just, it ends up at the Smithsonian, it ends up in the National Collections. So these are called the National Collections, and, and um, by, by dint of their rarity and their good state of preservation stuff, they'll always be cared for. I mean, there's just, um, uh, this really is a state-of-the-art facility, and for so many years the museum has felt they own these things. Um, and in some way, I suppose we do, but 
um, more and more, I think, in this climate of repatriation, it's one that's exploring ways like this group's uh, travel here to um, make this material more broadly known and more broadly accessible. And I think uh, the most important part is we, 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 we now have an avenue and, and, and a way to access um, these things to be shown to our people in our area. Roderick McFarlane uh, worked for the Hudson's Bay Company in 1860, 1859, 1860. And I think like a lot of um, Hudson's Bay Company men, it got real boring around the post, you know? If nobody was in town, there's nobody come down. Uh, uh, and, and, and so while he was waiting for both the Inuvialuit to come up the river uh, and then the um, the Dene, the Athabascan people, to come down the river uh, to bring the skins that they had to trade. Um, he got very interested in collecting natural history objects. And a lot of what he collected were birds. Um, and we've got a huge collection of bird eggs from um, Fort McPherson area and, and Fort Good Hope. Um, and, uh, uh, bird skins, and he collected fish. We've got, there's another pod there's another place like this, one of the ones down there, that's just floor to ceiling glass jars full of fish and snakes and turtles and uh, squirmy, ugly things. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he collected a lot of those and, and he sent them all back uh, to Washington. But he got very interested in collecting ethnographic objects. <clears throat> one interesting uh, thing on it before, I left in Newark uh, a few days ago by talking to William Nassigaro. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, his father, Big Joe Nasugaro, he said he heard his father, Big Joe, speak about McFarlalik. McFarlalik, old McFarlane. So that name was passed, you know, he heard about it. Yeah. yeah. Big Joe Nasugaro heard about okay. McFarlane from his, huh. his father and his you can see the old tag on this one that said um, Fort Anderson McFarland and then on the back side of the tag there's a little skull and crossbones because it was poisoned in August of 1984 just to keep the bugs because you can see that some of the bug damage on, on, on that one anyway so it's a little embarrassing but there it is yeah I'm really impressed with the preservation of, of the artifacts, the clothing. Um, and we all know in the north um, to have something sitting around for that long period of time, it would be all gone by now. So lucky for us, we, we did have the McFarland that fella that um, that purchased these these weapons, these tools, these clothing, and brought them down here for preservation. And you have to remember that you know at the time. All these things were sort of the day-to-day -day things that people had. And you could trade one and go home and make another one. And it's really, it's, it's sort of by dint of preservation and, and the fact that this stuff survives in the museum that have gained value and, and, and excitement, you know, over the years. Well, I just think McFarlane is a pretty interesting character and personally, I. I like the, the documentation, or I find it, it, it compelling, the documentation that's out there. I like the image of McFarlane with all his slavey guides and voyageur from the south going out to the Anderson River. And, you know, these Anderson River people are really feisty and territorial. And they say, yeah, I don't think that you're going to come on our turf without a fight. And, you know, eventually they kind of broker these friendly trading relationships. But McFarlane on his side kind of said, wow, these people are really great, you know, they're like, they're ready to rip and roar and defend their territory and I think they would be great trade partners. So he wasn't, neither of them was scared off from the other. There were good traders and bad traders. And uh, the general sort of feeling that sort of come down through 
the history in the records was that M Mr. McFarlane was, uh, was essentially a sympathetic character and, and he was genuinely interested in the, uh, the people that came to trade and, and, and to work with. I think in, in those early years of people who didn't uh, understand or speak the language, they used a lot of, of uh, si um, motion, uh, signal. like. I'm not exactly sure what year it was, but in 1861, 1861 or 1862, there was a really bad smallpox, measles epidemic, and uh, almost 20% of the Nuvialuit population perished in that one epidemic. Um, and his collecting stops almost at that same time. And there's such, such a variety. So for someone to be able to get the variety of, of uh, of, of the specimens that they gathered in those years, it's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. It almost looked like he knew exactly what he was going there for, what his purpose was to, and to get it all documented. Is It's very interesting how these old collections and old tools sort of every generation get rediscovered and um, investigated with new eyes. Check. Check. Yeah, we can see it Is it, for a baby, is it something very fancy for a baby, is it something that some women did to trade with this guy? He's yeah. given tobacco for anything, you know, go home and make a really nice little parker and we'll trade it for something. I'm, um, I'm looking at it like... What? Take a close look, because it's such fancy work. As opposed to this one, which looks like it really was worn, right? Yeah. It really does look mm -hmm. like you can almost imagine some playing. When, when Mr. McFarland collected it, he, he had it cataloged as an infant's deerskin shirt. Mm. So, whether you want to believe it or not. See, does it even look like it's been worn? It yeah. doesn't to me. You can, you can look at it. is 7659. I would ask you, Helen, because I'm wondering you know, if they are to the most toilet for babies or hey. small. Mm -hmm. you know? I, don't think so. I think the only thing that's small they ever need is shoes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for their little feet. What, what about dolls, you know, it, on, on the Yupik, yeah. you know, the Yupik people would make wooden dolls and, and dress them very, very nicely. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, that there's a, a New Gallic tradition at all? Or? Actually, in, in uh, my grandfather's book, Ainulia, he talked about them making baleen dolls, but the, and he said that skill was lost as when, like, people, old people were dying off because of epidemics. So maybe they did make clothing for dolls too. Gee, before I left, you know Mabel Chicks here? Mm -hmm. Well, she makes these dolls. She dresses them like a man. She dresses them like a woman. And my grandchildren really like them. So here I was buying them for them. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. They really like them too. Yeah. So women still do make uh, dolls yeah. back home, yeah. and they're very popular. They're very popular. Mm -hmm. I know my wife, right now, she's in her spare time, she's mm -hmm. doing quite a few traditional dolls. Eh? Mm -hmm. And does she make clothing for them? Yes, yeah. Skin clothing, or? Right now it's fabric, it's fabric but uh, fur around the hoods and mm -hmm. mitts and boots. We feel tremendously fortunate, you know, that uh, people like Albert and Helen can come here and, 
and uh, they have so much knowledge and 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 wisdom and experience and 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 it's also funny to see things that sometimes there's something in the collection that they don't know personally from experience but once they start thinking about it and talking about it there's memories to conversations they might have had you know with their parents and their grandparents so suddenly being in the pod looking at these old objects it's like being in a time machine you know where you sort of carry back uh, a century or a century and a half you know to another time and there's tremendous respect uh, for um, northern native peoples and the rapport that they had you know with the land and it's such an important model today when we see the destruction of the ecosystem and, and, and the deterioration of so many of the values that are important humanistic values and, and that are so celebrated when, when, when elders talk about the old way of, of sharing and cultural sharing and interaction. And because the caribou hair is, is uh, hollow in the water, it, it wouldn't sink right away. It'll stay floating. So they would be able to just to tie on by the antlers and then pull them to the shore to pull them up and work on them. Do you know of places uh, that are crossing areas that would be good for people still do this sort of crossing areas? Swimming point. <laughs> I've done it a few times on the Anderson River and the Anderson Forks. Oh, you have? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah.